So welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are joining us. Um, thank you, Hannah. So today I'm really, really happy and pleased to be here with Pantia Lee. And uh, Pantia is working with us uh, in the movement um, uh, strategy research. And uh, she's gonna tell us a lot more. Pantia is the principal of Reboot, uh, which is a design research uh, firm that has been partnering with us for now over two years, I think. Over a year, wow. We've, we've done a lot of work in a year. Yes, yes, you're really productive together. Um, and um, I also wanna mention that uh, Zach is here with her. He's also principal at Reboot, um, and we hope to be learning a lot from them. Um, and uh, before Pantia uh, starts talking, I just wanted to make sure that you all uh, feel free to ask questions and interrupt and interact with us as you're hearing the many interesting, fascinating things that that she's gonna share with us today, okay? Uh, so to start, tell us a bit more about Reboot. Sure. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, great. Hello. Hello? Yes. Great. Uh, so Reboot is a design firm that works with uh, mission-driven organizations to design policies and services and products that help them better meet the needs of their users and of their constituents. Um, so that means we work from anyone from the UN to the city of New York to grassroots activist co co collectives. Um, and you know, we were, we were founded on the belief that people should have a greater say in the policies and the products that impact their lives. Um, and we do that by bringing in a lot of the practices that the private sector uses to design things people actually want and need. And we try and translate that to the public sector and to the social sector, where there's not always the same incentives or the same accountability and mechanisms. Um, and so what that means in practice is we've done everything from um, helping the government of Libya post-revolution uh, design the world's first uh, mobile voter registration and elections management system to um, working with New York City on uh, criminal justice reform. Um, we've been working specifically on bail reform and helping immigrants better understand their rights. Um, so a range of things. Yes, fascinating, yeah. fascinating. And um, and how the work with the Wikimedia Foundation, right? Like how, how has Reboot been working with the Wikimedia Foundation? Yeah, so um, I think our work together started about just over a year ago. Um, a lot of Reboot's work is global, and so um, I think it was at a point where the foundation was thinking about investing more deeply into understanding the really diverse communities that you guys serve all over the world. And so it really started with this uh, new readers project where we were helping um, you all design and conduct um, design research in Nigeria and India to try and inform um, strategies from communications to product to partnerships, whatnot. Um, and I know that's led to some really interesting things that um, you know Jack and Zach are doing around communications, around sort of offline su support that Anne's leading, whatnot. Um, so that's where it started. And then we did some work around um, mapping your various audiences. Um, developing an audience framework and thinking about how to prioritize engagement and investment in research on different audiences, um, which led to some work um, around conducting design research with, with, with editors, actually. Um, with editors? Great. Uh, and um, so we've been working with the editing team in, um, in uh, mid-sized wikis um, in South Korea, in the Czech Republic, to understand the editor experience, um, where all you are, where you guys are gaining people and losing people and learning from lateral communities as well. Um, and then sort of coming full circle, we've been obviously doing work um, around movement strategy, um, track D, now called New Voices, um, research in Brazil and Indonesia, just to understand how are people getting information? What are the trends that the foundation and the movement need to be aware of um, looking out to the next 15 years? Um, how do people get online? How do they come to seek and trust information online? Um, what do they know about Wikipedia and do they care? Um, so some of those questions that we've been batting around to inform the strategy process. Yes, and, uh, and why design research? Like how design research compares to a more analytics, data-driven approach? Yeah, so you know, 
design research is at the heart of a lot of what Reboot does um, because we believe that fundamentally understanding human experiences, um, human behaviors, mental models is critical to designing things that people actually want and need and will use. Um, and so what that means is, you know, instead of just cold, hard logic, looking at sort of market analytics, which are important, um, we also use empathy as a primary processing tool. Um, and it's been really cool to have foundation staff with us on all of these um, research projects to understand, okay, once we talk to all these different users and potential users of Wikipedia, can we walk in their shoes? Can we understand um, what they care about, how they feel about things, how they get online, what the challenges that they have are? Um, because if we can understand that and put ourselves in their shoes, that will make us better strategists, that will make us better designers. Um, and I think it's, it's actually, we do a lot of generative design research, which means we don't necessarily know what the solution or answer will be at the very start of the process. Um, compared to some of the more, I think, evaluative work that the foundation currently does, um, which um, is also very important. Um, I know the product teams have been doing a lot um, around sort of, you know, testing different sort of products and approaches and iterating upon those. But I think some of the more generative work here has been really valuable um, for this sort of strategy process where we want to think bigger, bigger picture. Um, so yeah. And, and you were thinking, we were just talking about the, the movement strategy and how, right, like how ambitious this big process is and um, and I think that everyone is really interested and excited to hear what are the findings so far from Brazil and Indonesia we have a 25 page memo that you're all welcome to read um, you know uh, I think we have we have a uh, we have a lot of findings that we're still processing and want to work with you all and the movement strategy team um, over the, the coming few weeks. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that is coming out from the research is that um, I think looking forward, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia movement is going to have to think about how Wikipedia is not just a, a destination for knowledge and for information, but how it can become a source of knowledge and a source of information in all the different and diverse ways that people learn. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the internet was a very different place when Wikipedia first started. Um, what we're seeing now and what we're finding through the research is people are learning and getting information in all these really diverse and fascinating ways. Um, from people learning to, you know, cook and groom their eyebrows on YouTube, um, to, you know, all the different homework help communities, the brainly.coms, the other things, um, you know, and young people especially are just finding really creative and new ways to learn, to share information, to get information, and they're not really going to websites anymore. Um, and so, you know, if we play that out for Wikipedia, I think it's interesting to think about how the site um, and, how, and how the platform and all the knowledge that you guys have, how to make it more modular, how to make it more portable, to be able to take the resource that you all have built and feed it into all the diverse and different channels and ways that people are learning. Um, and I think that's going to be um, something quite interesting because you know, the first 15 years was, you know, I think for you all really about building this incredible uh, resource um, and really thinking about how this production model works. Um, the next 15 years might be really thinking about, okay, so then once we have this information, how do we actually get it out to people? What is the distribution model? Um, and I think that's going to be really interesting to, you know, look at how Wikimedia innovates next. And some of like, and what would be some of the key insights when you're thinking about like Brazil and Indonesia specifically, right? There are there things that stood out for you. Um, something that was really fascinating for us was uh, looking at the rise of messaging apps and just how prevalent and popular they are now. Um, I think. WhatsApp is installed in something like two-thirds of smartphones in Indonesia, and it grew 300% um, between 2015 and 2016. Um, and that's, there's a lot of factors uh, driving that, one of them being that a lot of telcos, mobile network operators, are offering these apps um, for free. They're zero-rating them, or they're including them in sort of data bundles and packages whatnot. 
Um, and so these are really, you know, whether it's social networking apps, messaging apps, they're really becoming people's on-ramp to the internet. And for some people, they, they are the only ways that they are getting online. And they're not even thinking, thinking about using WhatsApp as being online or using the internet. Um, and where cost is a factor or where it's just like fun to chat with and share links with your friends, um, what does that mean for Wikipedia? Um, you know, how, how, you know, it, and I think what's interesting as well is people are also using these um, messaging apps now, not just to you know chat and to share links. They're also forming these um, what we were calling sort of hyper-targeted social networks. Like people don't want to use Facebook anymore. They're saying, "Gosh, Facebook is for old people." You know, we are. I mean, I'm like, uh, okay, uh, I use Facebook, um, but uh, so Facebook is for old people. What we want to do now is we want to form our networks for when we go to an event. Afterwards, we have our community that we're, we, we form a WhatsApp group around that. Um, we, I have a study group for every single one of my classes at university. Um, I want to form these hyper-targeted so social networks, and then um, and my free messaging app that the telco is supporting is enabling me to do that. So what does that mean for Wikipedia? How do you guys appear and show up and help people in these study groups and appear organically in context? Is that in-app previews of Wikipedia content? Um, is it some other ways to sort of you know, help people share information where and how they're doing so? Um, and I think that, that was really fascinating to us. Um, and then I know you guys know this, but um, there's obviously a lot of RAND confusion. Um, that we surfaced, and I know has been, you know, talked about, uh, you know, and I know the comms team is, is working on this, but um, Wikipedia has great brand recognition, but a lot of brand confusion. Um, and so what that means is people think of you all as, you know, this is a, this is a technology giant. We know the name, but, you know, we, we'll compare it to a Google or a Facebook. Um, that's kind of crappy for you because you get judged then to be a pretty poor search engine or a really confusing social network. Um, and so, you know, and so how do we help people really understand what Wikipedia is, how it works, and why they should care? Um, and those are some of the things that are coming out. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of the other findings that were surfaced. Yeah, and, and I'm also interested like in talking about the youth, right? Like you mentioned that, and, um, and what are some of the key interesting things that we are seeing particularly with that audience? Uh, and if there are things there that we should be particularly paying attention to as we think about our next 15 years as a movement. Cool. That, that's a that's a big question. Um, what are the kids doing? Uh, so I think one thing that is really interesting about uh, the youth that we were looking at is trust in content. What, what whether or not they trust content um, doesn't really matter. Trust doesn't equal usage. Trust doesn't equal utility. Um, you're seeing a generation that is highly skeptical of media, of information sources, and particularly of online content. Um, and there's a lot of factors that give rise to that. Um, in Brazil and Indonesia specifically, you have um, long history of government control of the media. Um, you have highly concentrated media ownership in both markets. Um, you, have, uh, you have the proliferation of you know, fake news and, the, and, and you know, people now use sort of fake news as a term to describe seemingly everything. Um, and you have uh, business models that incentivize clickbait and sensational content. So, so, so there's lots of reasons that we can talk about. But ultimately, what we're seeing is young people uh, don't trust the content that they have, or, or, they, or they know content is biased, but they will use it anyway. Um, they, they will then take that content and discuss it with their friends to try and, you know, uh, triangulate between lots of different sources to say, okay, you know, sh should, I, should I use this? For what purposes? I know it's biased. Um, and, I think, and I think that's quite interesting because Wikipedia and Wikimedians spend a lot of time thinking about trust and accuracy. Um, and 
that's great, but also how do we think about relevance and utility and what's actually going to get people to use this content? And you know, one of the things that we're seeing too around trust is that the indicators of trust are changing. You know, young people are not trusting institutions to give them credible, verifiable content. They're trusting each other. Um, and so they are looking for um, indicators such as number of followers, number of likes on articles, um, other sort of social, in, more individual indicators, you know, the, the reputation of a content curator to help them determine what content they should um, trust and use. Um, and I think there's really interesting implications there then for Wikipedia because your process um, and your content is driven by individuals. And so, you know, is there a way of showcasing that and surfacing that um, to help people understand how the sausage is made because they want to know that to then understand, you know, whether or not they should um, invest in and use a piece of content. Um, yeah, uh, and then may may maybe the final point on young people uh, is that, you know, I think we hear visual, we hear real time, we hear social, um, and we know all that. Um, but those aren't just buzzwords. I mean, ki kids, uh, young people are getting their news on Instagram. You know, instead of going to the website of a newspaper, they are following the Instagram account of the newspaper because we're sitting there and they're scrolling through like, this is the exact amount of content that I want on a significant news story. Less than 100 words. That's it, you know, big photo, great, scroll through. They're, they're, they're getting breaking news by following trending topics on Twitter. Um, they're then taking that to WhatsApp to discuss with their friends. So what does that mean for Wikipedia? Um, you know, do we need to think about um, using, allowing video as references, um, for example? Do we think about, uh, I don't know, push alerts? around articles that are getting sort of rapid, distributed, and concentrated edits. So that people, you know, so Wikipedia can be seen as relevant in real time in the way that, you know, they, they want their news and information. Um, I think those are interesting questions to explore and, and, and wrestle with. Yeah, and and I'm wondering here now that you you just mentioned some of the possible opportunities and things that we could be exploring and considering, and uh, and how we take all that right. We touch base on you touch base on some of the bigger key findings. Um, how youth uh, is relating to content information, how they're accessing it. Um, so making sense of that and connecting that with the five thematic directions of uh, the strategy, right? Like how you were seeing those, how are you seeing what you learned and saw from Indonesia and Brazil uh, relating to, to the teams? Yeah. Uh, well, um, so we were really excited to see the five movement strategy themes. Um, they are ambitious, they are visionary, they are comprehensive. Um, and we were then also thinking about how to map our findings against those. Um, and I think what's interesting is we tried to separate out between um, objectives and strategies and then tactics. Because I think the five themes are slightly different in that way. Um, so I'm going to get the letters confused. Um, Okay, you have, uh, but you know the the ones around um, um, being a respected and relevant source of knowledge. That is an objective, um, and we can do that through you know by through uh, by advancing with technology. Um, we can do that by engaging the knowledge ecosystem. Those are tactics. Um, you know, becoming a truly global movement. That's an objective, um, and you know, again, we can do that th sort of through technology, through engaging diverse partners, and so as oh, perfect. And so, um, as we were mapping some of the opportunities that we saw, um, and I know we have a workshop with some um, of the movement strategy folks after this, we we, we tried to essentially sort of map our opportunities um, into a matrix of sorts. I, I, I know folks can't see this to understand, you know, how we use technology. To do to meet each of these objectives. Um, obviously, the work that we were doing was really focused on um, on readers, on um, communities, on audiences. Um, but we know that you know just strong, healthy communities will be critical and foundational to driving all of this forward. But you know, our work under this wasn't really focused on track A. Um, and I think what's really then interesting about this is 
the, you know, this notion of being more modular, more portable, you know, engaging with diverse partners to push content out. I think that's really going to uh, be at the intersection of all of these themes. Um, you know, how do you work with part, how do you work with educational institutions to think about using Wikipedia content in after school programs that extend learning outside of the classroom? Um, how do you all um, work with uh, nonprofits that are, you know, investing in skills training for unemployed youth um, to take Wikipedia content, mix and match it to develop a curricula? Um, I think those will require both a mix of technology and partnerships, um, and uh, and I think you know those will effectively help Wikipedia be relevant and global and sustainable into the future. So yes, thank you, thank you for like showing and and uh, talking talk about this map and how you are interpreting that based on the based on the data. And I think another um, uh, thing that I would love to hear from you is that how do you think we are serving? the emerging markets and emerging communities, right? Are we like, what are the things that we uh, could be doing um, differently there? Um, and what are the ways of actually them uh, identifying their needs and then serving those needs? Um, so I think in terms of um, emerging markets, uh, you know, I think one thing that I know we've all been talking about is uh, emerging markets, global south, it's a very broad term. Um, and you all have been uh, investing in research in a lot of specific markets. Um, so, you know, I think one key step moving forward is to try and disentangle some of this and to break these markets apart. Um, so if you take a look at Indonesia and Nigeria, for example, where you guys been, have invested in primary research, um, these are quite different markets. Um, let's take a look at, um, uh, you know, mobile penetration and cost of data, for example. Uh, Nigeria um, may be representative of markets in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, data is relatively expensive, and so people ration it. It's kind of a scarce resource. Um, and so the strategies that you guys develop there um, will be applicable to certain regions. But Indonesia, um, where cost of data is dropping um, quite rapidly, um, even though there's still sort of barriers to access, that might be a much more sort of um, illustrative view of where different markets are going um, in terms of um, in terms of internet usage, um, information behaviors, whatnot. And so I think first step might just be to sort of disentangle um, emerging markets and think about what each market can tell you about larger patterns in, 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 in which regions. Um, and then I think from there, uh, we see that Wikipedia has, you know, we talked about sort of brand recognition, um, whatnot, uh, but I think one group or, one, 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 one set of users that the foundation I know and, and the movement is thinking about, you know, whether and how we can better serve them is what we might term sort of more marginalized communities, um, lower income users, whatnot. I know that's been a topic of conversation here. And I think that is an area where there is uh, still a significant gap um, through no fault of the movement. Uh, you know, these are populations that, you know, for lots of reasons, um, you know, uh, ed levels of education, income, whatnot, um, simply are not getting online um, or are not able to, uh, you, you know, get to and use the information that Wikipedia provides once they are. And so I think an interesting question um, in these markets and with these users in particular is, what does the movement want to serve them? Um, and if you do, uh, who are the partners that you might need to engage to do that? Um, so there are, uh, you know, there are nonprofits, there are government programs, there are other folks that you know, sort of specialize in serving um, communities and populations such as these that very much need the content that Wikipedia has that could really learn from and draw on the energy um, and the passion of the community that you all have. These folks, you know, uh, we work with tons of nonprofits. 
we want to uh, develop educational content in X or Y way. Um, we have the, we have, we, we know how to reach low-income populations, but we don't necessarily know how to you know, package and put together things for them or have the resources to invest in developing this content. And so I think you know, um, that's an area that the movement might continue to explore because um, we do see that as a, as a gap right now. So I, um, I think we, we already, I don't know, I don't have my phone on me, so I don't know how we're doing on time. 30. Um, how are you folks feeling in terms of asking questions and uh, jumping in? Uh, because I think I have I have more questions and I can like keep asking them, but I just want to do a check and open a little bit more of the floor for us to have more of a conversation um, with Pantia and with the group. Um, so how are we feeling? Can like do we have questions? Do we have comments? Yes, we have Sati there. Um, Brendan. Go over there. Oh, there's no mic in there. Okay. Hello. 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 Okay. So um, I have many questions too, but I'm gonna ask one that's probably not fully filled out. Um, and I guess my question is: a lot of what you've said have been talking about how um, kind of a comparison, right? That like we we sitting here, you know, today in San Francisco, understand a world certain way, we see Wikipedia in a certain way, we do research and we ask people to understand kind of Wikipedia in their own context, right? And then there is this, this feeling, I guess I get, where we say, well, they have barriers to, um, let's say, accessing the world in the way we do. And I guess I'm asking, that's a very, that focuses a lot on deficiencies, right? Like barriers, like things that they don't have or ways in which they do different things. And I guess I'm asking, in what way should we actually be learning from them? Should we actually be saying maybe the world is trending in a way where we're actually behind um, and they're progressing and instead of trying to um, um, match them to us, maybe we should be matching us to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that um, I, I don't necessarily mean to say, you know, there are people have deficiencies. I, I think it's more there are there are barriers. Um, so Wikipedia um, works a certain way right now that then sort of erects barriers to people being able to access and use you all. Um, and so, you know, what are ways that then the the movement foundation might think of uh, uh, addressing those barriers? Um, I do think that there are things that the movement can definitely learn from the creativity um, of, and it's, 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 it's hard to talk about these populations because we're talking about, you know, quite a diverse um, set of users and markets. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that has been really interesting is the rise of these social networks. Um, people that have, you know, cost barriers to be able to use the internet are getting around them in quite creative ways. Um, you know, when telcos are offering um, file transfer for free on these, you know, all of a sudden you see a rush. You know, everyone's now, you know, instead of using email, just using like WhatsApp um, to, you know, basically send everything around. Uh, and so that's actually quite interesting. Um, instead of using other social networks, they are creating their own. Um, and I think that's a really um, interesting way for people, uh, for you all to explore. Um, I think also there are really interesting, um, you know, we work with a lot with um, nonprofits and media organizations and whatnot that are leveraging traditional media in quite interesting ways as well. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, how do we use television and radio um, in creative ways to deliver educational content. Um, and I think that could be an area um, you know, for you all to explore as well. Uh, so, yeah. so then I guess then my follow up to that is then um, you've kind of laid out. It feels like two models. One where right now we're kind of this self encased thing, right? A website like a Facebook, like an ecosystem in a sense. And what I'm hearing from you is that we actually need to be more ubiquitous, right? That we need to be embedded in some way. We need to show up in ways that might not even be branded in a way that's recognizable, but if our true mission is about knowledge, let's say a part of it is about knowledge dissemination, then that knowledge, it's really important for that to show up in the ways that people are accessing it. And so 
how, I guess, in that vein, and that's a lot about readers, how do you think about content, let's say curation, creation, um, kind of the upstream pieces to dissemination? How does that, um, that end of the flow match into kind of this ubiquity that you're kind of describing at the, the other end of the flow? So I think that I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, instead of becoming like a product or instead of thinking ourselves as a product and knowledge here, you know, how do we actually be like an engine that pushes, you know, information out, you know, in ways that, you know, to enable ubiquity, um, to be able to, you know, push it out to other content creators or folks that are, you know, providing educational resources, whatnot. And I think that, um, I think the role of curators here um, is uh, really, interesting and important. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, young people following bloggers and bloggers and, you know, that have built up trust in certain ways um, that um, may not see Wikipedia content as credible or easy to use or whatnot. And so um, does the role of the community, for example, um, change here? Um, do the role of affiliates change? Um, you know, right now, I think the community often, in the way that I understand it, um, a lot of it is dominated by editors um, um, that are contributing content um, and, you know, and, and doing sort of a lot of different functions. But, you know, in the future, is it about developing um, topic guides to uh, to help people, you know, uh, to help nonprofits that are thinking about digital literacy. Um, okay, so these are the resources that we have. Um, these are, you know, through APIs, through, you know, more modular content, whatnot. This is how you might be able to mix and match it to design your own curricula in X or Y way. Um, is it about thinking about uh, community, community members as liaisons um, between, you know, other content creators, whether they're more individuals that, you know, alternative history bloggers on YouTube um, to nonprofits focusing on, um, you know, uh, educating people about, you know, women's rights. Um, I think those are different ways that you all might be able to think about it. Um, but I think this ubiquity point um, is, is a really interesting one and definitely worth considering. Please, this might. Really it's a really great question where you ended, and I think one other piece of it that's somewhat simple to add on to what Panthea said is the more ubiquitous you are and the more people you're reaching, the more opportunities you have to build somebody up the ladder of engagements where they might become a contributor and actually be an editor. So there is a, a sort of feedback loop that comes from reaching more people in terms of potentially increasing the pool of contributors. Oh yeah, so let's um, maybe go over them. Um, can you? Yeah. Let's get some people. All right, so we have a set of questions from Blue Jeans here. Uh, JMO, you're first in the list, and then we can go to Edward and Amir. Hello, how's my audio? You sound great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Thank you very much for for speaking with us. Um, I uh, I had a question um, about methods um, because I'm a I'm a design researcher um, and so I like methods. Um, my question is is around how Reboot gets to uh, gets to the point of providing these uh, you know the high the high priority findings and recommendations. So I I I, I believe that a lot of people have an idea of what how design research works in terms of you know you talk to people you observe what they do you go to where they live um you find out kind of how they interact with in our case you know wikipedia or information technologies or technology in general how it fits into their lives um and then you take lots of notes um but i think that it's it's really interesting and and kind of less understood how you get from okay we we learned all this stuff about people and about what they do and what they believe and what motivates them how do we get to the point where we are synthesizing that and prioritizing what are the most important findings um what are the what are the big takeaways and how, and uh for for this audience you know for our clients wikimedia in this case um, I think I think Reboot did a really great job of that in the New Readers Project, um, but I, I'd love to hear a little more, kind of about how that process works within your organization. Um, 
I love nerding out on methods. Um, and so thank you for the question. Um, you know, so I think for us, um, I'll try not to get lost in details, um, but I think, you know, where we started with um, you all is thinking about this research framework. Uh, this research framework um, and what were the questions that we wanted to ask. And usually where we start here is, um, you know, one, one um, principle we have in mind is always don't necessarily ask about the thing that you're most interested in, which means we did not start by asking people about Wikipedia. We started by asking people about just information systems, like what, what information they need, what they care about, how they get it. And we go from sort of the broadest to how they get information to then sort of narrow how do they get online to then, you know, um, how do they come to Wikipedia? How do they use Wikipedia? And so we go from sort of broadest to most narrow. Um, happy to talk about the research framework. I know that's sort of been shared um, uh, with different team members. Um, and then as part of the field research, um, we bring a team of local researchers um, from the, uh, the city, the community, wherever that we're working, um, and then paired with a Wikimedia team as well um, to make sure that we both have the institutional sort of context and knowledge. Um, and, uh, and then also um, the sort of local and cultural translation um, as well. Um, for us, it's really important to make sure we spend a lot of time with you all to understand your strategies, your work processes, whatnot. Because I think sometimes user-centered design is uh, misinterpreted as, you know, just let's focus on the end user. Um, whereas in fact, you know, we actually need to do a lot of work to understand the organizations and the institutions that serve them to be able to design strategies that are actually feasible and implementable rather than, uh, you know, shiny blue, blue sky deck that you can't do anything with. Um, and then I think from there, in terms of the actual research, um, we do uh, a lot of sort of semi-structured um, ethnographic interviews. We do user observation. We do uh, tech demos, whatnot. I'm happy to get into any of those. But then we end up doing nightly synthesis sessions um, with the entire team, which means we are making sense of the data collected every single day. Um, what are the patterns? Um, what are the connections? And where should we go deeper the next day? Because this type of research, it's really applied. And so we're not asking the same set of questions um, every single day. Um, if we're asking the same questions we did on day 10 as we are on day one, we would have failed. You know, as we're thinking about opportunities, we're trying to figure out how to hone in deeper on those so that we can start sort of testing some of your hypotheses. Um, and so it's quite sort of active and iterative research. Um, and then I would say, in terms of how we got to some of these higher priority findings, um, and then I'll stop because I might be losing people, um, is um, we, we tried to map all the users that we spoke to in each context against a matrix um, uh, along sort of digital competence and literacy, and then also the type of use cases um, that they are using the internet for. Um, from there, we then segmented into a couple of um, uh, subsets of users, and then um, and so you all have user personas now um, for these sort of different um, archetypes. And then from there, we mapped the uh, user journey of each of these types of users to to help them to to help us understand in their information journey to try and get the information that they want and need to do X or Y, um, depending on the type of user. What are the biggest barriers that they face, and what are the most valuable information sources from them, for them? For the ma most valuable information sources, we then think about what can we learn from these lateral examples, and then for the biggest barriers, we then try and sort of aggregate them to understand, okay, what are the most prominent and significant barriers that are preventing more users from being able to take advantage of Wikipedia? Um, and then that's how we end up um, rank ordering the opportunities that then we put forward to you guys. Um, that was pretty fast. I'm not sure if that was useful. Um. Excellent answer. Thanks. Nice work. OK, so we had, I think, Edward next. Is that right? Edward, would you like to take over? Sure. My um, apologies. I'm in a coffee shop right now. So can you all hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, talking with us. Um, uh, yeah, this is super interesting work, and I've been following the audience's work for a while. Um, and I've actually been tr uh, trying to use it in my own work. Um, so I, I do a lot of surveys at the foundation and with communities. So I'm also interested in the methods a little bit. Um, 
So I'm actually curious to hear generally what have been some of the limitations or challenges that you're finding in conducti conducting your research, uh, uh, especially what you said at the beginning, which is around how you try to bring voices into the design process. So what have been some challenges around that? And perhaps is, if there's been anything in our context that has been challenging for you. Time. <laughs> uh, challenges. I think that, um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges for us has been um, the, the thinking about the breadth of um, opportunities there and then how to organize them, uh, which is why sort of I, um, going to sort of Jonathan's questions previously, ha for us having a really structured process to um, narrow down to rank order to what uh, to, to process the opportunities and findings was really important. But I think um, that has been a challenge. But I think what it's been helped by is the fact that um, it's been really refreshing and really exciting to work with such a cross-functional team. Um, we've been working with global reach and partnerships and community uh, and, and community engagement and comms and product and whatnot. And so that you all having the conversations um, to then give us a sort of more targeted brief, that's been really um, useful. Um, I think that we've, I think there is more that we could do to think about how to um, use surveys and other sort of quantitative methods um, in conjunction with the more qualitative methods that we use. Um, typically when we do this, we, you know, design research is really good at going deep um, and, you know, understanding um, people's, you know, behaviors, attitudes, whatnot. Um, and I know we've, and, and we've been working with Dan and taking a look at some of the uh, trends and findings from the mobile surveys, um, thinking about how that informs our research, I think we could do more perhaps to think about, okay, so now we go, we've gone really deep. How do we go broad again to, you know, test out the representativeness um, of some of our findings here um, against a wider audience? Um, and, uh, and then I know that um, I think one area that has also been um, somewhat challenging is thinking about uh, is 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 the time factor? Um, you know, we've we've been doing this sort of quite rapidly, and we've had basically time for about you know two week sprints in each of these countries, um, and so uh, which gets which has been about sort of seventy respondents um, per country, and so um, but and so we haven't really had time to be able to prototype um, any you know sort of solutions or strategies, uh, which sometimes given a longer sprint we are able to do um, to test out and come back with, with user feedback on um, specific strategies or you know, product designs that you might want to pursue. On that note of time, I think there was a question also there about the user personas not being posted. They're not posted yet, but they will be soon. So there's a, a big deck coming with all, all the personas from Indonesia and Brazil and more information. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And then I believe that the next question is from Amir. Is that right? Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, uh, you might also hear my son in the back. Um, okay, uh, so quick question. Um, it, it was all really, really, really interesting. Uh, thank you so much for coming and talking about this. Uh, I appreciate this a lot. Uh, the global perspective is, uh, is uh, really important for us. Um, my question is about something that you mentioned uh, in the beginning uh, of, uh, of your talk. You said that uh, uh, messenger networks uh, like WhatsApp are really important today. Uh, how do you think uh, Wikipedia could uh, get there? Uh, because currently we are very much a web organization. Uh, people access us through browsers and a few people access us through uh, the Wikipedia app, but uh, it's it's almost the same as reading it in a browser. Um, what could we do with these networks, given that they are so important and popular, uh, possibly even more popular than Facebook by now? Uh, what could we do there? Um, that's a good question. Um, I uh, so I think that. First of all, is just, I think, really understanding what people are using these networks for. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
it wasn't really a focus of our research, but it sort of emerged quite quickly as a key um, trend that we were seeing. Um, so, you know, I think I mentioned, you know, whether it was study groups, I think that is actually, that could be a big opportunity um, for Wikipedia um, in terms of people are talking about homework assignments, they're debating, um, they're de debating um, topics learned in class and whatnot sort of on these networks. Um, and, you know, is there a way to bring in um, Wikipedia to, to be a sort of like a context provider um, when people are having these debates and conversations? Um, not sure the specific sort of, you know, product um, um, strategy that would mean, but basically how do you be sort of organic and in context? Um, I, I think there's been some experiments with WhatsApp chatbots. I'm not sure. I think I heard something about this. Um, but um, those could be ways uh, to help people, uh, you know, again, sort of get information from Wikipedia um, that is in many markets, you know, low cost and where people are. Um, I think that there's also, um, there's also, you know, in many of these markets, we found that um, the ways that, so this, this now maybe ties a little bit into the editor's work that we've been doing, um, but, in some of these markets, there are not great um, representations of like essentially sort of people's like culture and context um, on the internet. Um, I think Wikipedia's current um, um, model of you know determining sort of what is good content that can be included on the site um, is um, presents some barriers to cultures that may be sort of more oral or may not um, have the um, you know resources and the the, the references rather um, to to uh, to have to, to be like a you know verified and trustworthy sort of Wikipedia article. Um, are there ways to um, to have different versions of Wikipedia perhaps that um, allow um, different types of contribution that you might be, you know, sourcing um, via these these chat channels that then sort of gets put into larger processes of verification of whatnot. Um, do you guys think about it as a way to sort of get content or to source material that then might be put through more rigorous processes? I think those are also things that you could explore. Um, but yeah, those are some ideas. Yeah. Amir, does that answer your question? Do you have uh, follow-ups or comments? Um, yeah, it answers the question. Thank you. Um, uh, just, just a tiny follow-up. Uh, you only mentioned WhatsApp, but uh, I know that there are several other platforms around the world, like Viber or WeChat or Telegram. Uh, um, what are, are there any others that you suggest looking closely at? Which, which are the important ones around the world, or maybe in particular regions? Uh I know some of this is in our um, in our findings memo. Uh, I do know in both markets, uh, WhatsApp was dominant. I know Line and Telegram um, are, and people use them for various purposes. You know, we've heard uh, WhatsApp we might use for more sort of professional and schools reasons, but we might use Line because we like their emojis better. Um, and uh, and so um, we we didn't really do a deep dive into um, comparing the messaging apps, but um, there is good uh, there is good market research um, on some of this. Um, a note of caution on the market research is oftentimes they really sort of just give you um, penetration in terms of like downloads, whatnot, and that m may not be the same thing as usage. Um, and so I think sort of probing into why people are using specific messaging platforms for what and how um, could be something that you guys might want to think about further. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, we have a question there. Thank you, Amir. And uh, we have Rosie there for, with a question. Do we have the mic in the back? Thank you. This has been pretty enlightening for me. I have a question about who's being left behind. So for the first 15 years, there's been a lot said, a lot written about that teenagers and young men in their 20s are the ones who kind of dug in deep and were the ones that um, 
um, spent the most time on the Wikipedia that we, we've known of the last 15 years or so. And that there, was, there were definitely big segments of people who were kind of left out. Um, a very small percentage of women versus men, um, and so on. And so I'm wondering, does your research touch on that? Do you have a feeling for, um, you've spoken to groups of people in Indonesia and Brazil, but can you sense who has been left out of the conversation in Brazil, in Indonesia? And is there a way that in the next 15 years, we're not going to replicate this feeling of somebody being left out? Will we be able to be more inclusive based on the things you're kind of learning so that um, um, we kind of learn from what we've experienced in these first 15 years? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I think on just to your earlier point around um, it being mostly young men really digging into this. Um, I think that uh, our work um, on editors, which is most, which has been um, in South Korea and the Czech Republic, that uh, somewhat confirms uh, what you're saying here. And we were sort of probing into where you lose people um, in terms of contributors. Um, what is the editor experience and where do people drop off? Um, and I think we see that there are elements of um, you know, policies, norms, cultural norms and practices that uh, you know, pose barriers to, uh, I think you know, we saw um, sometimes you know, women feeling ex excluded or just you know, it was a difficult, it was, I think we heard people say, uh, you know, Wikipedia is almost more, more, more hassle than it's worth uh, getting into the tussles um, to be to be able to contribute, and so I think we saw that. I'm not sure, and and I think now people are then finding and founding other um, other. You know, we saw FemiWiki um, in South Korea, this new resource that had been developed by uh, contributors to Wikipedia that just you know didn't want to get into the um, the the fight as they saw it. Um, we're seeing sort of uh, older people, retirees, that we spoke with that had. Uh, that um, chose instead to contribute to um, other platforms. We, you know, we were analyzing how Coursera, uh, the sort of MOOC platform, how they recruit and um, you know onboard and then uh, continue sort of encouraging contributors um, to their platform. And, and and they've been successful. We've seen um, with you know uh, retirees that actually have a lot to give. And so those are some of the things that we're finding through the editors' research. Um, in terms of movement strategy, I think we got a sort of big push from Adeli and her team really to look at who's been left behind and to really talk with populations that are not currently online, um, lower income populations, um, to you know, test out some of our hypotheses that you know, Wikipedia may not be reaching them and may not be able to on its current trajectory. And I think that's really where um, some of the ideas around partnering with um, nonprofits or other social organizations that really serve these populations um, and whose like, you know, core value is reach is doing outreach to them and then thinking about how you guys bring your unique model to then, you know, be the engine of their their work um, in terms of contributing content or, you know, uh, community members helping them navigate your content. Um, I think that's where some of those ideas came from um, out of the push to speak with those types of populations. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the, um, um, for us, right, when we were thinking about this and like really taking advantage of design research and really being able to hear from the users that we were trying to serve, uh, we had no limits, right? It was really like, let's go there and really understand. And I think we were trying to probe and go further into who we are leaving behind now. So those are really like a lot of people in this countries, right? And they, they are like women, um, uh, not um, non-white populations, right? Like so racially, uh, racially and ethnicity uh, diverse populations, um, um, age diversity, like all the all the things that we have um, that we feel that we should be paying more attention to, and those are part of the new voices that we feel that have not been uh, represented or or included in our conversations, right? And now in this process, um, we want them to be sitting at the table and being part of that. And and I think the work that we did in Brazil and Indonesia, but also with all the other work that we have been doing in all those countries, were uh, um, 
uh, are really our go to that, right? Let's really open the floor and let's really elevate those voices and make sure that we are hearing from them. And um, and we are now at cycle three, right? In the movement strategy process. And I think that is the that is how this information is coming right to the communities. Um, and uh, and we are sharing all that and we are connecting. Okay, so where we want to be in 15 years and uh, can, right, like can we work and have have those new voices as part of this movement, right? Can we build something that it's not, um, that is with them? Um, and I think we are, right, like I'm excited for this phase because I think we have a lot to exchange, a lot to learn from each other, right? Like Sati was talking about how we learn from them. And I think there's so many things that um, we we have to learn and it, they are out there, right? Like these findings, the insights and, um, and really interesting creative ideas are out there, but we need to open up the space for the new voices to be in the dialogue. Um, yeah. One more question, and who is it? Jessica. Jessica, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for this great um, talk to begin with. It was really, really, really interesting. Just a quick question, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, you mentioned something that was really interesting, I thought, around brand awareness and brand confusion that, you know, a lot of about a lot of people know about Wikipedia, but they might not have a good understanding of um, who we are and how we work. Um, and I was just interested in getting some high level thoughts and suggestions from you of, you know, how that can be addressed. Um, what can we do better as a, as a movement and a foundation side in order to educate people about, you know, who we are, um, how we work and, and why they should care, as you put it um, very clearly. Um, so I think that um, we're seeing a lot of interest from different users around sort of understanding the process um, behind like how their uh, you know how how the sausage gets made. Um, we we heard people say you know I know Wikipedia, but they seem to be you know they're 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 not very transparent. We don't know where they are. We don't know how they work. Um, but you know Google seems much more transparent because Google posts videos about you know how they work and we like see their offices and their offices are colorful and we're like really that's that's so fascinating um and so you know and and we saw people um we had uh users that were on um the the wikipedia instagram we were watching them sort of scroll through and they go i don't get it like what's the what's the what's the logic basically behind all of this content um you know because people are, you guys cover everything. And so, you know, people are following Instagram accounts that basically um, relate to a specific theme, you know, like cute cats, um, beautiful sunsets, you know, space, whatever. And so, you know, um, they're trying to understand also like, what is Wikipedia? Because I can't make sense of all of this content. Um, and so, you know, I think there are things that you all might be able to do to expose the process. Who are the people behind Wikipedia? People wanna know. People want to know how Wikipedia is made, who are the people behind them, because they're trusting, like we're seeing trust shift from institutions to individuals. And so you guys are a movement of individuals. Let's let's show that um, because, uh, and, and there are things that you can do, whether in terms of, you know, communications campaigns, but then also um, I think on articles and on the platform to be able to, you know, show that process um, to help people understand how it gets made. Um, and then I think around um, the actual sort of product, is it around disaggregating, you know, just knowledge, um, you know, one platform and developing um, sub channels, topic guides, whatever it is, thinking about, you know, um, how you communicate, whether it's sub channels um, around your Instagram accounts or sort of other things to, to help people understand, okay, Wikipedia is all of these things, but I don't have to just engage with Wikipedia um, as like one singular platform. Um, I, you know, I can, I can find whatever it is that Wikipedia offers that is interesting to me um, and sort of ignore the other stuff. And I think um, that is that, that could be another interesting area to explore. Um, but, 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 but I know the comms team has been doing different sort of communications campaign um, in local languages and um, through, um, through other sort of, you know, locally relevant distribution channels. And so they might be better suited to speak to that. 
So I think that was our last question. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you, Pantia. This was really good. We're really happy to have you here. And um, yeah, Having thank me. you for um, all attending as well. And that's it for this morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been really fun work.